Hello again. So today we're going to continue our conversation about pharmacokinetics, and the topic of this particular class is going to be drug excretion. We've already covered drug administration, absorption, distribution, and metabolism. And the last piece is excretion. So a question that I would like you to consider for today's class is after having consumed a drug or after having uh, received a drug, where does it go? And how does that process occur? Well, as is shown on this slide, there are five primary ways in which any person can get rid of a drug from their body. This includes through the feces, which is um, through the bile, and I'll explain this in much more detail, through the urine, which is probably the most common way in which drugs are excreted, and then for completeness sake, through exhaled air as breathing, in sweat, and in saliva. So we're going to focus the beginning part of this particular class on these two, biliary excretion of drugs in the feces and urinary excretion of drugs. So in order to understand biliary excretion of drugs, we're going to return to something that we introduced in the first class, and that is the enterohepatic circulation. And this particular part um, of the class requires an understanding of some pretty basic anatomy. So let me orient you to this slide. Here we see the liver, which as we've heard before, is the primary powerhouse through which most drugs that are used in clinical medicine today pass through. Typically, after giving a drug by mouth, it get ab gets absorbed from the intestine into the latter part of the bowel through the enterohepatic circulation and into the gut. In addition to this, then, the liver is also responsible for metabolism of drugs, which we talked about in our last class. The product of drug metabolism can either be sent back out into the systemic circulation for circulation throughout the body, or it can be passed back into the small intestine in bile. So what is bile? Bile is a product from the liver and the gallbladder. And bile is used to metabolize different types of foods that we consume in our diet, predominantly high fat content foods. So we have the capacity to excrete drugs through this exact same pathway that is used to excrete bile into the gut. And in this particular situation, you see a reverse of transit. You see the drug being delivered to the terminal ileum, being delivered into the large intestine, and ultimately being excreted in the feces. So this is referred to as biliary excretion of drugs. It's not at all uncommon to have drugs that undergo some percentage of biliary excretion and urinary excretion combined. So now let's talk about the most common method in which drugs are excreted, and this is in the urine. In order to be able to appreciate urinary excretion of drugs, we're going to return to anatomy again. As you all likely know, we each possess, if we're healthy, two kidneys. Each kidney is made up of an individual functional unit referred to as the nephron. Each kidney contains somewhere in the ballpark of a million nephrons. This independent functioning unit is what we're going to focus on here. It contains multiple different functional parts. The first of these is the glomerulus shown here. In addition to this is a long piece of, for sake of a better word, tubing. This tubing is divided into a proximal tubule, a loop of Henle, shown here, a distal tubule shown here, and a collecting duct shown here. All of the collecting ducts ultimately end up in delivering their product, which is urine, into the ureter for ultimate excretion. So how does drug metabolism work, understanding the process and the anatomy of the nephron?
So it actually involves three different processes. It may involve a combination of these three, or it may actually only involve one of these processes. It depends on the drug. The first of these is glomerular filtration. So if we go back to our picture, this is that the drug gets delivered to the glomerulus through the blood supply and gets filtered through the glomerulus into the tubule for ultimate excretion. If the drug is largely bound to plasma proteins, remember we talked about those a couple of classes ago, they are not filtered readily because they're too big to be able to be filtered through the glomerulus. The second process is active tubular secretion. This is a common methodology for urinary drug excretion for drugs that are considered to be weak acids or weak bases. In this particular process, it is active in nature. Thus, it involves a degree of transport involving energy. And you will recall back when we talked about drug distribution and permeation principles, we talked about active secretion methodology as well. So it's similar. It's a repeat of that concept. So here you might have a tubular secretion pathway that is used by more than one drug. In the example that I'm giving you here, we're talking about two drugs, probenicid and penicillin. These two drugs compete for the same tubular secretion pathway. So therefore, there is a degree of competition for one versus the other. We will return to this concept when we talk about drug toxicity, because anything that has the potential to delay drug excretion increases the potential of adverse drug effect. It also, of course, introduces the concept of a delayed or prolonged duration of action of the drug. So it could be considered a good effect or a bad effect. And the third process involved in renal excretion is passive tubular reabsorption. So in this particular example, your drug is filtered through the glomerulus, but as it passes through the nephron, there is a reabsorption process that occurs. This is most likely to occur with drugs that are lipid soluble because they'll cross that lipid uh, cell membrane that we've talked about previously. It also helps if the drugs are not ionized. Remember that drugs that don't carry a charge will pass through cell membranes with greater ease than, do than those drugs that are charged. So those same permeation principles that we visited in earlier lectures are showing their face here again today. Passive tubular reabsorption will be greater for drugs that are lipid soluble and drugs that are not charged. The amount of drug excreted ultimately, renally excreted ultimately, will be the sum of the amount that is filtered through the glomerulus and secreted into the tubule minus the amount that's absorbed. So in pictorial form, it's this amount here filtered through the glomerulus, this part here where there is active secretion along the tubule into the lumen of the nephron minus that piece that is actively reabsorbed. This will be the ultimate excretion potential for any particular drug at the kidney as a site. So one of the things that we need to keep in mind is the actual delivery of the drug to the kidney itself. So what is shown on this particular slide in the, the pale nude color here is your structure of the nephron again, showing the glomerulus here, and then the tubular structure of the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct ultimately leading to the collection and excretion of urine. But the additional piece on this particular slide shows you a sense of the immense vascular supply. So shown in red here is the arterial blood supply. And this is bringing the drug to the kidney for excretion. The blue supply here 
is the veins or the venular supply, and this is the blood that is leaving the kidney and could include drugs that have been reabsorbed from the tubule back into the circulation uh, for systemic pass again. So appreciating the importance of vascular supply is a key facet of renal secretion throughout the entire nephron. Now, I'm going to complicate things ever so slightly by bringing you back to the concept of metabolism, but in this sense, combining it together with excretion. Because you will recall from before, we talked about metabolism being a process whereby drugs can be converted from prodrugs to active drugs, from active drugs to active metabolites, or relevant to this conversation, from active metabolites to something more polar, which is more excretable. So there is a part of metabolism that is interdigitated into elimination or excretion. So we consider the th term elimination to be an inclusive term to incorporate those components of metabolism that result in creating more excretable, typically more polar compounds, plus the process of excretion. So by definition, we can say elimination is the process whereby the body terminates drug action. It is a combination of metabolism, or the term that we've used commonly previously, biotransformation, and excretion. Now think about this for a moment. We've said before that drugs can be distributed in a widespread manner throughout the body. The kidney, the lungs, the brain, the GI tract, the liver, muscle, fat, etc. Pretty much any part of the body has the potential to be a delivery site following drug administration, depending, of course, upon the permeation principles that we've discussed previously. So therefore, when we consider elimination, we've got to consider elimination from multiple sites. So elimination of a drug from the body will require elimination from several sites. Just to give you an example of different scenarios, it could be elimination from the lung, liver, muscle, kidney. It could be a process of where biotransformation is occurring predominantly in the liver and the muscle. So for example, statin drugs used to lower cholesterol. And then in the kidney involves excretion. Or it could be biotransformation occurring in the liver and then delivery of that drug through the enterohepatic circulation into the bile for excretion in the feces. The point I'm trying to make here is that elimination has to occur from a multitude of different sites if the drug has been distributed to all of those sites. We have an interest in understanding the rate at which this process occurs. We refer to this as clearance. The rate of elimination is called clearance. So I'm going to bring you back to a slide that I showed you in the last lecture. And this is a slide that depicts drug disposition. And I think it's a nice way in which we can recapture some of the earlier principles that we have discussed in previous sessions. So let's walk our way through this slide one more time. It is depicting the scenario of drug disposition following oral administration of the drug. So we're going to start at this particular point here. Somebody swallows a particular medication. The medication will ultimately get absorbed. We know that at some point in time, the drug will exist as free drug in plasma. We also know that there is a potential that the drug may be bound to plasma proteins, recognizing that the drug will have limited, if any, effect whatsoever when it is bound to plasma proteins. We know that the drug can then be sequestered in different tissues. In this particular example, we are showing sequestration or storage in adipose or fat tissues.
Ultimately, from a pharmacodynamic perspective, which we will talk about in a future class, we will be very interested in how that free drug binds to receptors to bring about the wanted or unwanted effects following drug administration. Here we also show the interface between the lung and the free drug. So we can appreciate that free drugs can be expired through the lung, through exhalation or expired air as volatile metabolites. And I believe the example I gave you the last time was alcohol. We commonly expire or excrete or eliminate part of the consumed alcohol in our breathing or through our expired air. In addition to that, we see free drug being um, um, disposed to peripheral tissues. It may be excreted to the kidney or it may also have its primary target at receptors within the kidney. It has a bi-directional transport between the liver and plasma or circulation. In the liver itself, it can be recycled through the enterohepatic circulation and ultimately excreted as free drug or metabolite, uh, metabolites in the stool or possibly be reabsorbed again through the GI tract. So when we think of this particular type of scenario, we have a better appreciation of this interplay between all of the pharmacokinetic principles, absorption, distribution, metabolism or biotransformation, excretion, elimination. All of these processes are occurring in concert with each other in a very dynamic manner. So when we talk about clearance, we try and utilize some type of mathemat mathematical equations. For most drugs that we use in clinical medicine today, the rate of, elim of elimination is directly proportional to the concentration of the drug attained when that drug is used as clinically indicated. Okay, that's an important concept, as clinically indicated. So that is, the more drug you give, the rate of elimination increases. This is like a kind of homeostatic process, a way of keeping the body in tune or in balance. So this type of elimination is considered to be not saturable. We use the term first order kinetics to describe this. And the equation looks something like clearance being the rate of elimination divided by the concentration represented by the letter C. Now, return to what I said to you before. You have to eliminate drugs from multiple different sites. So you will have a rate of elimination from the kidney, you'll have a rate of elimination from the liver, rate of elimination from the lung, from the muscle, whatever the sites were that the drug was distributed to. So you have individual components that are ultimately going to have to be considered when considering the rate of elimination or the clearance for the drug from the body, and we refer to this as systemic clearance. So this is going to look something like what's shown on this slide. You might have a rate of elimination for the kidney, a rate of elimination from the liver, and a rate of elimination from other sites, adipose tissue or muscle. And the overall rate of elimination or clearance, which would be considered the systemic clearance, is going to be the combination of kidney, liver, and other site of clearance. Why is this important? Well, drugs carry a multitude of different properties. So you might have a drug that is very lipid soluble and it's going to be sequestered in adipose tissue. And therefore the rate of clearance from adipose tissue might be an awful lot slower than the rate of clearance, for example, from the kidney. So when we're evaluating drugs before they're actually approved for use in, in patients or in humans, we have to have a sense of what this rate of clearance is from all the sites from which the drug is distributed to. 
in essence, at the end of the day, what we use clinically is this overall systemic clearance. How long does it take for the drug to be eliminated from the body in its entirety so that we're able to actually estimate this concept of the interplay between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics? So if you look just at the upper panel on this particular slide, this demonstrates the relationship between plasma concentration of the drug as a function of time shown on the x-axis. And what you can see, if you were to interpret the x-axis as being rate, being a, 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 as a function of time, you can see that at higher plasma concentrations, the rate of uh, decline in drug concentration is much more rapid for this section of the curve than it is for this section of the curve. Ultimately, attempting to emphasize that the rate of elimination is proportional to the concentration of the drug. The higher the concentration of the drug, the faster the rate of elimination. The lower the concentration of the drug, the lower the rate of concentration. This is actually important because Clinically, when we prescribe drugs, we want to have uh, an ability to calculate how long the drug's going to stay in the body. Let's say, for example, you have a patient who comes into the emergency room and they've overdosed on a medication. It is very, very helpful for us to be able to estimate the amount of time it will take for that drug to be eliminated from the body, or at least the length of time it will take for that drug to have no more toxic effects. It's also very helpful to know how frequently you have to give a drug to a particular patient. All of you who filled a prescription know that drugs can be dosed once a day, twice a day, three times a day. Part of this requirement of the frequency of dose administration is dependent on how long it takes for the drug to be excreted. So we've got to try and have some type of harmonization code or some universal language whereby we can all understand what we're talking about when we talk about clearance. So we use the term half-life to be more complete. It's actually referred to as elimination half-life, not too surprisingly. So this is the time required to eliminate 50% of the amount of drug in the body. Said another way, reduce plasma concentration by 50%. And often you'll see it denoted as an uppercase T and then a subscript, a half. So a T half is referred to as the elimination half-life. How do we calculate it? Real easy. So what we do is in the experimental studies in humans before the drug is approved for use in clinical practice, we do what's called a dose response study or, or we, we establish a dose response curve. We give individuals a single dose of a drug. We then measure how much of that drug is in plasma at specified time points over three, four, five, whatever number of hours. And then we plot out the concentration of the drug in plasma as a function of time exactly the same way as is shown here. We take different time points along the x-axis at whatever time interval is deemed to be appropriate for that particular drug, and we measure plasma concentration. And this area here, underneath this curve, is referred to, not too surprisingly, as the area under the curve. And we use the area under the curve to be able to calculate the half-life. Importantly, this concept of elimination half-life can only be used for drugs that are eliminated through pathways that are not saturable, i.e., drugs that follow first-order kinetics. And it will be affected, the half-life will be affected by anything that changes the volume of distribution, because that's going to alter the concentration of the drug, or anything that changes the clearance, because that's also going to affect the concentration of the drug. So anything that affects delivery, anything that affects elimination, ultimately has the potential to alter the elimination half-life of any given drug that we use clinically. 
This is probably a little bit more helpful of a diagram. So it is essentially recapitulating what was shown in the previous slide. On the y-axis, plasma drug concentration. On the x-axis, time. And here you can show following administration of the drug at time zero, you see a peak in concentration, let's assume in this particular scenario, it's an IV administration of the drug, so 100% of the drug that you administered is in circulation. So you get this peak concentration here, and then following out over time by taking blood samples over these time intervals, you then plot the concentration at all of these time points. And then you look for where on this curve was there a 50% reduction in plasma concentration? So what you're seeing on this curve is this is the 50% or the halfway mark, and you basically drop down a vertical to your time axis or your x-axis, and this is now your half-life for your drug. Very simple. And now you can impose upon this every half-life on top of it. So you see a further 50% reduction from this point somewhere around here on this graph. So if you follow this out onto your concentration curve, then you see a second half-life. And so you have a way of predicting how long it's going to take for the drug to be eliminated from plasma pretty much close to 100%. And what's happening to that drug in that process? Well, let's use the beaker analogy. So here we have a beaker representing plasma concentration. So all of these blue dots inside this beaker represents the drug. So at this particular time point, this area under the curve represented by this time point, a lot of drug, a lot of drug and concentration. It's undergoing elimination, both metabolism and excretion, and you see in this particular example, 50% less of the drug. And then in another half-life shown on this curve here, another 50%. So start with 100%, down to 50%. 50% of 50% is 25% in this particular example. And then you could imagine going out 50% of 25 will be 12.5% etc., etc. So you can calculate over the timeline how long the drug is going to maintain, be maintained in plasma, how long it's actually going to take for the drug to be eliminated over time. And down here, even to simplify it a little bit further, is the amount of drug excreted per unit time. This being 50% less than what's represented here. This being 50% less than what's represented here. So this is a graphic description of um, half-life. So let's use a hypothetical example. How long will it take for the body to eliminate 100 milligrams of drug X? If 100 milligrams of the drug in plasma at time zero, and assuming that the half-life of that drug is four hours, then in one half-life, you're going to have half of 100 milligrams left in plasma, 50 milligrams, one half-life. After two half-lives, eight hours, you're going to have 25 milligrams of drug remaining in plasma. After three half-lives, you're going to have 12.5 milligrams. You're getting the picture here, I think. After four half-lives, you have 6.25 milligrams of drug. Now, you can imagine that you're never going to get to zero because you're always going to be 50% of the number. But what's important clinically is that at some point along this sequence, the drug will stop having both the potential for a toxic effect as well as a therapeutic effect. And for most extents and purposes, we are thinking about therapeutic effect. At what point along this time course do we lose the therapeutic effect of a drug? And at what point along this time curve can we assume that all of the drug pretty much all of the drug will be eliminated from plasma. So we use this statement below is for all drugs that are eliminated via first order kinetics, more than 90% of the drug would be eliminated 
in four half lives. And that's a good ballpark to remember. That let's say, you, same, same example we used before, you, you, you caught your finger in a door, you've taken ibuprofen. Um, you want to know how long is that ibuprofen hanging around in your bloodstream. Well, the average half-life is somewhere around six hours. So within 24 hours, less than 10% of the drug is remaining in plasma. So we can use this knowledge to help um, understand the way in which we dose medications, the way in which we would expect drugs to have both their beneficial and their, their toxic effects. Now, I've said before, that that principle of half-life applies to drugs that follow a, an elimination pathway that is not saturable, i.e. first-order kinetics. But there are drugs that exhibit capacity-limited elimination. And this is a very different scenario and an important scenario to appreciate. In these types of situation, the elimination of the drug is saturable. And once that elimination pathway is saturated, it doesn't have the capacity to ramp up how quickly it eliminates the drug as the concentration increases. What happens in actuality is that a constant amount of drug, usually measured in terms of milligrams, micrograms, or grams, are metabolized per unit of time. And this is referred to as zero-order kinetics. This is very important because let's say you, you take a drug or you take a patient who has overdosed on a medication. The concept of the elimination pathway being saturated means that the patient is exposed to a toxicity for a much longer period of time. And the reality is that for most drugs that we use in clinical medicine today, first-order kinetics applies as long as we use the doses that are recommended for clinical practice. Ultimately, any elimination pathway theoretically could be saturated if we exposed an individual to enough of the drug. So what I am showing you here today as examples are drugs that follow zero-order kinetics, i.e. their elimination pathway is saturable, drugs that follow zero-order kinetics, even at the doses that are commonly used in clinical medicine. So these ones we watch out for very, very closely. And the best two examples that I think is worthwhile sharing with you today are alcohol, we think of this as a recreational activity, or phenytoin, which is a medication used uh, to try and control seizures in patients with um, epilepsy, so anti -epileptic, uh, an anti-epileptic drug. So with these two medications, we watch very carefully how these drugs are actually metabolized. So let me give you an example, and, and, and I'm hoping that this is an example that may resonate with a reasonable number of you in our, our uh, listening audience uh, today. A 150-pound male college student, so healthy, well within ideal body weight, presuming his height is somewhere around 5'8", 5'10", drinks five pints of beer. Now, each pint of beer... Um, each unit of alcohol contains 8 grams, and then you double that up at 16 grams multiplied by, by, uh, by 5, and we end up with 140 grams. So five pints of beer, on average, contains 140 grams of alcohol, C2H5OH. And let's assume that this individual drank this rather quickly over a three-hour period of time. And uh, he's a little sleepy, and he goes asleep. Uh, goes to bed. And uh, we assume, based on our information that we know from many studies, that his blood alcohol concentration is approximately 250 milligrams per deciliter. And just for reference point, this is way, way, way above legal limits. If alcohol was to follow first order kinetics, then you would assume he would half his blood alcohol concentration every half life. Okay, so the assumption is that by 8 o'clock the next morning, with a half-life of one hour, he would only have one milligram per deciliter in his blood, so well within the legal reference range. And we know that alcohol 
as long as the enzymatic pathways are not saturated, its half-life is about one hour, okay? But we also know that the enzymatic pathways get saturated after about one to two drinks, so or one to two units. So after about 16 grams of alcohol, the metabolism follows zero order kinetics, okay? So if we look at this example then, and we recognize that approximately eight grams of alcohol are metabolized every hour, and this young man goes to sleep. After eight hours of sleep, he will have metabolized 64 grams of the original 140 grams that he consumed. It will be metabolized and excreted, so eliminated. However, that leaves 76 grams in his body and his blood alcohol concentration will be somewhere in the ballpark of 120 milligrams per deciliter. So still way, way, way above what is referred to as a legal range. And alcohol metabolism is probably the most important example of zero-order kinetics in human pharmacology, mainly because alcohol use is, is a prevalent activity in, in society generally. So I would ask you to remember this particular example. So on this particular curve, let me just show you this interplay between zero order kinetics and first order kinetics. So again, much like what we've seen previously, the rate of elimination is shown here on the y-axis and plasma concentration on the x-axis, so reversed from the previous diagram. So let's assume in this example we're talking about alcohol and we know that the main initial enzyme involved in the metabolism of alcohol, which is called alcohol dehydrogenase, it is going to function at these lower levels following, let's say, the first drink, the first one and a half or, or, or three quarters of the first pint that this young gentleman is, uh, uh, consumes. But once he saturates that metabolic pathway, once he uses up all that enzymatic pathway, now he's saturated. Now he can no longer deal with this continued consumption. And we see a steady state or a steady rate of elimination occurring after that time point. And that's represented by the lower panel on this slide, where the concentration of the drug is not impacting the rate at which the uh, elimination of the drug is occurring, because not enough metabolic pathway to actually deal with the problem. Okay, so now let's think about how we actually give drugs clinically. So you all know that typically when we prescribe drugs in clinical practice, we use more than one dose. There are a few exceptions to that rule, for the, but for the most part with an antibiotic, it's a seven or a 10 day course. Um, with, with, let's say, a drug to try and reduce heartburn, we generally use it over several weeks. For a drug that is used to control uh, cholesterol levels, it's used over, over many years, ideally. So what about when you uh, consider continuous and multiple dosing kinetics? So what the, the curves that I've shown you represent following a, giving a dose of a drug and then following plasma concentration over time. But what about with, with repeated administration? So when a drug that exhibits first order kinetics is administered continuously and or intermittently, it accumulates, okay? It, it, it builds up in, in the circulation until it reaches a plateau or a steady, a steady state concentration. And think of that term, steady state concentration. Why is that? Well, it actually makes a lot of sense. In the beginning, when you're giving the drug, the rate of administration is far greater than the rate of elimination because the rate of elimination is dependent on the concentration. So in order for the rate of elimination to catch up with the rate of administration, the concentration of the drug has to rise in plasma. So when initially administered, the rate of administration is going to be quicker than the rate of elimination. As the drug continues to be administered, the rate of elimination is gradually going to increase 
because the concentration of the drug is increasing. Remember, elimination is proportional to drug concentration as long as the drug is following first order kinetics. So gradually, you're going to start off like this, administration, um, elimination, and as the concentration of the drug rises, you're going to see the rate at which these two are occurring equilibrating. So eventually, the rate of administration will equal the rate of elimination. This is the definition of steady state concentration. Let me reiterate that. The rate of administration when it equals the rate of elimination is defined as the steady state concentration. Now, because the time to reach steady state uh, concentration is dependent on the time it takes for the rate of elimination to equal the rate of administration, the time to reach steady state concentration is a function of the elimination half-life. Well, that makes sense because we've just talked about how we calculate elimination half-life. And we've already said that for drugs that follow first-order kinetics, it typically takes four to five half-lives for elimination to be completed. So if these two processes have to align, well, therefore, it's intuitive to say that it takes approximately four to five half-lives to reach steady state concentration. If the half-life changes, then the time to reach steady state concentration will also change. And remember what I said previously, the sorts of things that change half-life are the things that slow down elimination or increase distribution or decrease distribution. So half-life can be a movable feast, but ultimately, the time it takes to reach steady state concentration will be four to five, four to five half lives. The time required to reach steady state is independent of drug dose or rate or frequency of dosing. Well, that makes sense as well because it's all about this equilibration of the two processes. So this slide, I'd like you to pay some attention to because it attempts to try and incorporate elimination uh, on the right-hand part of the slide, so elimination here, and um, reaching steady state concentration here. So let me orient you to, to uh, the information on this slide. So again, on the x-axis, we have percentage of steady state uh, plasma drug concentration, so plasma concentration on, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is time. And the units of time, one, two, three, four, five, is one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives, four half-lives, and five half-lives. So we can say, based on what we've said previously, following infusion of the drug, starting here, we see an increase in steady state concentration, or attain, I'm sorry, we should say attainment of steady state concentration being a function of the half-life. One half-life, we've got to 50% of steady state concentration, Two half-lives, 75% of steady state concentration. Three, four half-lives, 94% of steady state concentration, etc. Recognizing that we never quite get to the ultimate zero or the ultimate 100. So at this point, we've reached steady state concentration. Now we stop the drug, okay? And now we're talking about elimination. Well, we're going to talk about the reverse of what the process was to reach steady state concentration. So exactly the same concept. In one half-life, 50% of the drug has been eliminated. In two half-lives, a, a further 25% of the drug is eliminated. In three half-lives, a further 12.5% of the drug has been eliminated. In four half-lives, a further 6.25% of the drug has been eliminated. So upwards of 90% of the drug has been eliminated after four half-lives. So what I would like you to take home from this slide is how knowing the half-life of the drug, we're able to estimate how long it takes to get to steady state concentration and how long it takes to excrete drugs. This concept of half-life is critically important and one that I would really like you to have a good understanding of. The steady state concentration reached is directly proportional to the dose of the drug administered per unit of time and the elimination half-life, right? Concentration, impacts elimination, etc. 
If the dose of the drug is doubled, concentration doubled, the steady state concentration is also doubled because you're impacting drug administration and drug excretion. If the elimination half-life is doubled, the steady state concentration is also doubled. A drug administered by continuous infusion will reach steady state at the same rate as the drug administered intermittently. There's no change in the dose of the drug, so the concentration isn't altering. However, the plasma level might fluctuate a little bit following oral administration versus the steady infusion that would occur with IV administration which is a nice segue into talking about oral dosing of medication. In most cases, a single dose of a drug is sufficient to cause, is insufficient to cause a desired therapeutic effect. So what we've talked about before is a pharmacokinetic principle. Steady state concentration is a pharmacokinetic principle. But the reason we're giving the drug is to look for a pharmacodynamic effect. This is a therapeutic effect. So when you think about what I said before, in most situations, giving a patient one dose of a drug isn't going to bring about the therapeutic effect that we are looking for. So most situations, repeated doses are required to attain a steady state concentration and a therapeutic concentration. That's an important concept. You want to attain a steady state concentration and you want to attain a therapeutic concentration. In order to achieve this, we administer sufficient number of equal doses at regular intervals so that we reach this steady state concentration amount given equals the amount eliminated, but also that that reaches a therapeutic concentration. So we can't do this whole assessment of steady state concentration without having an appreciation for therapeutic concentration, which we'll talk about in, in later classes. The half-life helps us here because it helps us estimate how long it will take to get to 50% of steady state concentration, how long will it take to get to close to 100% of steady state concentration, and that's what we're gearing for. For example, think of antibiotics. We know that it takes a bit of time before the effect of antibiotics kick in. Part of that is because we have to get to a steady state concentration in addition to getting to a therapeutic concentration in order for the antibiotic to actually have its effect. If the dosing interval is shorter than four half-lives, okay, think about that. If the dosing interval is shorter than four half-lives, drug accumulation will occur, which kind of makes sense because if you give another dose of a drug before you get to that greater than 90% of the drug excreted, well, then you're left with 10% of the drug in situ. And then let's say you dose again. You're going to end up with this residual amount of drug in the systemic circulation that you're building upon. So ultimately, this concept of drug accumulation is hugely informed by an appreciation of how the half-life impacts the whole discussion. You can also kind of, uh, you, you can appreciate, it's, it's intuitive that if you give a drug at, let's say, six hourly intervals, you're going to get peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs. And the peak is going to occur sometime interval after drug administration, depending on absorption properties, distribution properties, et cetera, et cetera. And it's going to trough or, or reach a low point right before the next dose as a result of, of elimination processes. So you might end up with, with something that looks a little bit like this. So let's start off with a simple scenario, which is your black solid line. No jiggy jaggies, just your black solid line shown here, okay? So this is, not too surprisingly, IV administration. Simple, straightforward, predictable. The blue jagged line, if you look at down here is your x-axis, so it's time, shows 24-hour administration of the drug. So you get a peak. And then after 24 hours, you get a trough, a peak followed by a trough. So how do you know the drug works here? Well, you get a mean concentration. 
across these curves. So you look at your peaks and you look at your troughs and ultimately you draw out a mean. And it is ultimately the mean plasma concentration that you want to correlate with the therapeutic effect of the drug. So yes, you appreciate that there are going to be highs and lows, but ultimately, when it comes to the discussion of the effect of the drug, you want to ensure that the concentration of the drug across the broad spectrum of the time intended for use is of sufficient height to uh, bring about the therapeutic effect, o occupy the receptor, inhibit the enzyme, what, whatever the case may be, depending on the mechanism of the action of the drug. And then finally, the orange line represents eight hourly administration, so 8, 16, 24. And again, peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs, this kind of seesaw or sawtooth pattern um, of, of ebbs and flows in plasma concentration of the drug, ultimately looking at what that mean effect might be. And you know, the reality is looking at these curves without superimposing them on therapeutic effect is not very awe-inspiring. You know, it's just a, a dose-response curve. It, it's, it's, it's not really informative in and of its own right. But it's when you couple this with an appreciation for therapeutic effect that you really understand the, the true importance of the interplay between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And I'm sure many of you are now saying, well, then, you know, what, what's the value of loading dose versus a maintenance dose? Because what, what I'm showing you here is all maintenance, right? There's nothing here that's showing a bolus. So there are so many examples in clinical medicine where we use a loading dose. Probably one of the most common is, is uh, heparin. So heparin is an anticoagulant. And when you use heparin in many clinical scenarios, you give a bolus of heparin up front, and maybe 1,000 units and maybe 10,000 units, and then you use a maintenance infusion of heparin as an anticoagulant uh, over time. Another example is with antibiotics. I think many of you are probably familiar, and I don't like to use trade names, but for the purpose of understanding, I'm using it here, a Z pack. So this is zithromycin, a macrolid antibiotic that is used commonly to, to treat uh, what are presumed to be bacterial infections. And any of you who have used a Z pack know that you take two pills up front and then you follow it for the next three to four days with one pill taken once a day at, at the same time point. The concept of the loading dose has nothing to do with pharmacokinetics at all. The idea here is you want to try and achieve a therapeutic plasma concentration, not a steady state plasma concentration. It actually doesn't hugely impact the time to steady state concentration. So what you want to achieve is occupy your receptor, inhibit your enzyme, kill your bug, whatever the case may be. You want to try and bring about a therapeutic effect much more quickly. So loading dose really doesn't have much of a role to play in a discussion of pharmacokinetics. It's much more um, a discussion relevant uh, to pharmacodynamics. So we've reached the end point of the sections on pharmacokinetics. So let's just summarize what we've talked about so far. And, and what I would really like you to be able to do is to have an appreciation and a reasonably in-depth understanding of how all of these concepts fit into each other so that when we move on to the next set of classes on pharmacodynamics, you'll be able to appreciate the, the, the connection between the two. So we've talked about administration, uh, different rights of administration. We introduced the concept of the first pass effect. Uh, we didn't talk a huge amount about compliance, but clearly if patients don't take the drug, well, for PK concepts will probably be irrelevant. Then there's the concept of absorption and all of the issues that have the ability to impact absorption, uh, distribution, understanding the three um, kind of virtual compartments that exist where drugs can actually go, the interplay of plasma proteins and how they can influence whether drugs have the ability to be effective or where drugs have the ability to distribute to, whether they're bound to plasma proteins or not. Uh, we talked about the different phases of metabolism, phase one and phase two, and how genomics can actually alter uh, drug 
uh, disposition actually impact pharmacokinetics, let alone pharmacodynamics. We haven't even gone there. Uh, drug interactions, the ability of, of different uh, enzymes being competed for or, or nutraceuticals um, competing with drugs for metabolic pathways. And then most recently talking about excretion and the interplay between metabolism and excretion in this concept of elimination and the kinetics of elimination. And then ultimately, this concept of drug concentration, not in terms of efficacy or therapeutic effect, but in terms of steady state concentration and how, how this all interplays uh, uh, together. Uh, to create what is referred to as a steady state concentration. And the last concept that I'm going to leave you with is that I would hope that you wouldn't consider pharmacokinetics, uh, that the pharmacokinetic profile of a drug is static. It's very much a dynamic concept. And there are multiple different things that can actually change the pharmacokinetic profile of a given drug in a given patient on a given day. And the sorts of things that are upfront and central to consider when we're using drugs clinically is the impact of disease. You know, the, the, the reality of this is, is that most of the time when we use drugs, the patients that we're using them in have a disease process or a process that we're trying to improve, reverse, control, whatever. And we recognize that disease states can markedly alter how uh, the body handles a drug. So for example, people with end-stage liver disease, uh, very often they have um, a reduction in their synthesis of plasma proteins. So um, binding to albumin or binding to different globulins can markedly reduce the bioavailability of the drug and the distribution of the drug and even the rate of metabolism of the drug. Uh, the vast majority of phase one metabolism uh, occurs in the liver, so again, uh, advanced uh, states of liver disease can, can significantly um, impact drug handling. Um, as I said previously, a lot of drugs are, are excreted by the liver. Um, so anything that reduces uh, renal blood flow, anything that reduces glomerular filtration rate, that's what GFR is, glomerular filtration rate, the amount of fluid um, uh, that is filtered by the glomerulus in the kidney. Anything that alters the potential to secrete drugs into the lumen of the nephron for, for the collecting duct or the proximal tubule for excretion can, can alter the disposition of the drug. Uh, heart failure, a common medical condition in, in clinical medicine. Very often patients with heart failure have fluid retention. Uh, so their circulating plasma volume increases. This can alter the um, volume of distribution of the drug. Uh, in addition, patients with heart failure very frequently have poor uh, pump function, poor left ventricular function. So this can result in reduced circulation and therefore reduced delivery of the drug to its intended site of action or even uh, for excretion to the kidney with a reduction in renal blood flow. Um, patients with pulmonary fibrosis, uh, particularly those patients who have difficulty breathing, um, they may have an asthmatic component to their pulmonary disease and we g deliver drugs uh, via inhalation, nebulizers, inhalers, etc. Um, then in patients with pulmonary fibrosis, that absorption of the drug from the site of, of delivery can, can be reduced. So that's just a very, very, very brief list. You can imagine there's a whole plethora of different disease states that can have a, a potential impact on, on pharmacokinetic profile. One that I think is, is worth mentioning, mainly because it's, it's not particularly well studied, but it's post-surgical states. So we all know that obesity is the scourge of our nation and, and gastric bypass surgery is becoming ever more common or, or at least bariatric procedures to try and, and control um, uh, weight loss or induce weight loss. We don't have a good understanding of how these surgical procedures alter um, absorption of drugs or alter pharmacokinetic profile of drugs. Uh, one, one good example is an exaggerated response to Coumadin in patients who've undergone gastric bypass surgery without us really having a good understanding as to what the mechanism of action of, of uh, the hyper-anticoagulated uh, hyper, uh, state these patients may experience following uh, bypass surgery. So keeping that in mind, that this is a fluid dynamic field that as we get more technological with our advances that we, we can impact uh, pharmacokinetic profile. 
One that I think is huge in clinical medicine today is polypharmacy. Um, certainly in the U.S., the average life expectancy is increasing. However, uh, patients may be living longer, but they're living with multiple comorbidities, and polypharmacy uh, comes in tandem with that. So having an appreciation for drug-drug interaction um, is something that we should always consider when we see patients who come in on a laundry list of, of different medications for a variety of connected or un uh, unrelated diseases. And the ability of these drugs to either induce metabolizing enzymes or, or saturate or compete for metabolizing pathways is, is worthy of, of consideration. And then is, is the whole genetics, and, and, and I think this is a field in its infancy. Uh, pharmacogenetics, the study of, of how uh, the human genome regulates how drugs are metabolized in different individuals. Uh, this is a fascinating area that is under very close uh, scrutiny and intense investigation, is how different people respond to different drugs based on polymorphisms in uh, metabolizing enzymes as a determinant of, of individual drug response, not only increased or decreased efficacy, but also increased or decreased toxicity. So I think this is a space that we should all be, be watching with, with close scrutiny. And then finally, I think it's important to understand the impact of age. So if we think about three different age groups shown on, on this particular slide, so, so our most young, whoops, sorry, let me go back here. Our youngest patients here, neonates, neonates here, uh, children, and then elderly patients. So we're somewhat simplistic a lot of the time in how we evaluate drugs. So the majority of the early phases of human drug development enroll people who are healthy and between the ages of 18 and let's say 45 or 50. The vast majority of drug use, however, doesn't occur in those age groups. It occurs in the elderly patients, very often occurs in children and, and neonates. And, and in many circumstances, we don't have good information from um, the drug development phases of, of drug evaluation to, to inform how drugs can be, how the distribution or disposition of drugs can be changed as, as a function of age. So this is just some of the information that's out there that's actually known, and it's uh, aligned according to the process of drug disposition, so absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And then um, over here, um, you can see that in some circumstances, no changes are actually known. But in some, there is actually an appreciation of a, a reduction in pharmacokinetic activity. So, for example, in the elderly, a reduction in, in phase one metabolic processes um, is known to occur, um, a kind of a natural aging process. In addition to this, um, there is a reduction in plasma volume, uh, you know, a somewhat relative degree of dehydration, so a lower volume of, of distribution for water-soluble drugs because the drug has been dissolved, so to speak, in a, a smaller concentration, or a higher volume of distribution for fat-soluble drugs um, or drugs bound to plasma proteins. So, you know, appreciating these sorts of changes as, as a function of age, I, I think affords one the opportunity to be more circumspect about uh, applying a one-size-fits-all when talking about pharmacokinetic profile for any drug. And, and I will emphasize this, we haven't even begun to talk about drug action. Uh, we've, purely, we've purely confined our conversation to how the body handles the drug not how the drug actually impacts the, the body. So I'm going to end this particular section, which is the pharmacokinetics section, bringing you back to a slide that I showed you uh, at the beginning of our, our classes in this particular course. And we have focused on, on this piece here. We focused on delivery of the drug administration, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And what we're going to move on to in our next section of our talk is this piece. We're going to talk about pharmacodynamics. And ultimately, we'll talk about clinical outcomes, re reduction in clinical events. But in the process of doing so, we're going to try our best 
to continue to introduce this concept of genetics how genetics alters, for example, metabolism. We've talked about the CYP enzyme, the cytochrome P450 system, and the different phenotypes and genotypes that can alter drug metabolism in our discussion of pharmacokinetics. We're also going to discuss the same concept when it comes to talking about pharmacodynamics and how our knowledge of um, the uh, genetics of any individual might actually guide drug therapy and try and use some pertinent examples from clinical medicine today. So we'll end class on that note, and, and I look forward to rejoining you in the next class where we are going to shift our conversation to pharmacodynamics and talk about drug action. Thanks very much for listening in on today's class, and I look forward to being back with you very soon.